Welcome, everyone. Greetings. We are so excited that you have joined Color of Change and the National Education Association for our Defend Black History School Board training. We recognize that you could be anywhere in the world, and with so much going on in the world, we are deeply honored that you have chosen to spend the next few hours equipping yourself with additional tools and resources in the pursuit of defending Black history. This will be recorded for future campaign purposes, and if you're ready to get into all we have in store for tonight's training, please drop some emojis in the chat or the number one, just to let us know that you are here. We have had over 1,000 people RSVP for today's training, and we want to make sure that y'all are ready to get into it. This presentation, um, we want it to be as interactive as possible. So please don't hesitate to utilize the chat throughout the presentation. We will have chat moderators standing by to answer any questions and provide support as necessary. So please drop your name, your pronouns, your location, and we wanna know how you heard about this training. The presentation would not be possible without our dedicated members who have been putting in time every Tuesday for the last five weeks in preparation for today's training. So a sincere, heartfelt thank you to all of our members and to everyone tuning in. My name is Elu Omilora. I am the program director here at Color of Change, and I'm joined today by so many amazing colleagues, including Destiny Newell, who's our senior campaign manager, Sherelle Eubanks, who's the senior policy analyst at National Education Association, and Karina Petty, our campaign organizing director. In just a few moments, I'll be handing things off to our chief of campaigns and programs, Kyle Bibby, who will prepare us to receive remarks, followed by a conversation with Becky Pringle, National Education Association president, and Rashad Robinson, the president at Color of Change. We'll then get into the bulk of the school board training, and we'll be closing out with next steps, including our calls to action and additional resources. We do wanna make sure that this is a safe space. We do have young people in this space. So we wanna be sure that we're all on the same page as it pertains to our community agreements. So the first is to please utilize the chat. We really encourage everyone to build community throughout this entire training and utilizing the chat is one of the first ways that we can see to it. We definitely want folks to show love. If there's something that you resonate throughout the presentation, please show love, drop some emojis, let us know. Be respectful of others. Um, ask as many questions as you feel necessary. We want you to feel informed and we welcome commentary. Um, please take action when prompted. There'll be a few calls to action and an opportunity at the end to receive additional resources. And without further ado, I'll be handing it off now to Kyle Bibby. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And we look forward to spending a great night with you. All right, good evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Kyle Bibby. I'm the Chief of Campaigns and Programs at Color of Change, and I'm very excited to join you all today and moderate this very important discussion leading into today's Defend Black History School Board Training. Uh, Color of Change and the National Education Association have come together in partnership to fight back against the attacks on Black history and ensure that there's truth in education. Together, we're building this multicultural gra grassroots movement uh, made up of educators, parents, students, and others from across the nation, all united as one. And we're gonna ensure that the attacks on our history in schools do not prevail and that we will preserve our history and uphold our democracy. Uh, through a series of following events, uh, our organizations will be bringing together members and supporters from across the nation. We'll tell our stories, uh, we'll fight for our students' education. And uh, I know some people in the room may have received an invite from Color of Change, others from the National Education Association or other coalition partners. So uh, in case you aren't familiar, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of uh, the two hosting organizations and set the stage for the remarks that we're gonna hear today from each of the, those organizations' presidents. So the first being, the National Education Association. Uh, this is the largest union, union of educators in the country, more than 3 million members. This includes elementary and secondary teachers, higher ed faculty, education support professionals, uh, and students preparing to become educators. Next is uh, Color of Change, where I am the chief of campaigns and programs. We are the nation's largest online racial justice organization with millions of members nationwide. 
So our partnership, uh, we've come together really to defend black history and, and preserve truth in educations, uh, truth in education for uh, all students nationwide. And as I mentioned earlier, some of you are educators, students, parents, representatives of organizations and, and organizers or just concerned community leaders and members. Um, so we wanna give the breadth of the experiences that are in this room right now. Uh, we're going to play a quick 90 second video to give some context uh, that uh, frames the discussion today for our presidents and lays the groundwork for uh, the subsequent training that we're going to start today. So, Aaron, could you please uh, play the video? Ban specific books. Banning additional books. Book bans. Book bans. Book bans. History is our greatest teacher, and we cannot learn from its mistakes if it is hidden from our shelves. The removal of voices that speak to the Black experience and the marginalization of Black heroes isn't just a ban on literature. It's an attack on Black history, on our ability to build a fair and just society. We will not go quietly. We are holding elected officials and book publishers accountable we are demanding they fight with us to reverse legislation that bans our history. But the fight isn't over. We'll continue to organize a grassroots fight against those who threaten to erase us by giving our communities tools to defend themselves. Together, we'll stand against the whitewashing of our libraries by refusing to be silenced. Because Black history is American history. Our stories of resistance and brilliance matter. Join us in ensuring future generations learn from voices of the past. Part of what we have to do in terms of activism is make people believe that they can fight for something that they actually can't necessarily touch, yes. that they haven't experienced, but to believe by coming together that something more is possible. We need to be able to learn about others, and we will continue to fight. We need you to show up at your school board meetings and fight for this. This is our history. It is our children's history. So we need you to show up and help fight for it. All right, great video. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot at stake for our children's education. And I know a lot of you are here today because you care about this and you're wondering how you can get involved in this fight. How can you share your story in the most effective way? And what are the best ways for you to connect with others and share resources? And we're definitely happy to help you with that. That's what this training is all about. And with that being said, there isn't really a better person to give uh, opening remarks for our training today than Becky Pringle. Uh, NEA President Becky Pringle is a fierce social justice warrior and defender of education rights, an unrelenting advocate for all students and communities of color, and a valued and respected voice in the education arena. A middle school science teacher with more than three decades of classroom experience, Becky is singularly focused on using her intellect, passion, and purpose to unite the members of the largest labor union in the nation and use that collective power to fulfill the promise of public education. So, um, Becky? floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kyle. It's so good to uh, join you and all the rest of the folks who have joined us this evening. There is no power for change that is greater than a community discovering what it cares about. With her words, author and educator Margaret Wheatley reminds us there is power in knowing that we care about our children, there is power. In believing that our caring will lead to justice, there is power. In electing school boards that are a true reflection of what we know our students need and deserve. As the body that determines what happens in our schools and in our students' classrooms, school boards are at the center of that power. They can and they should represent our entire community. I am so grateful for the strong partnership between the NEA and the Color of Change as we work together to defend the teaching of Black history in public schools across this nation, to empower Black families and communities to be part of NEA's fight 
to reclaim public education as a common good, as the foundation of our democracy, and then transform it into something it was actually never designed to be, a racially and socially just and equitable system that prepares every student, everyone, to succeed in a diverse and interdependent world. I am so proud to represent the 3 million members of the National Education Association. We have affiliate organizations in every single state. We have members in every congressional district. We have more than 14,000 locals across this nation. And NEA stands with them, defending their right to teach the truth to advocate for our students' right to have both windows and mirrors. We defend and promote and protect and strengthen public education in partnership with allies like Color of Change. On behalf of education professionals across this nation, I just need to say thank you. Thank you for being here, for joining us this evening. As elected leaders and others who stand against students and educators and families continue to try to diminish our educators' professional responsibility. As our opponents continue to ban books, try to erase and rewrite 400 years of black struggle and progress and to tear down diversity and equity and inclusion, our students need educators and parents and communities, they need you to stand together in collaboration and partnership, partnership, just as we are doing tonight. Last month, we saw our parents and our grandparents and our communities come together and elect candidates up and down the ballot who are committed to strengthening our public schools. In school board races, the vast majority of candidates who ran platforms that parents and voters prioritize, allowing educators to teach the truth of this nation's history, ensuring students have the academic, social, and the emotional support they need to thrive, keeping students safe from, safe from gun violence, not just in our schools, but in their communities, and addressing educator shortages. Those candidates won 80% of the school board races across this nation. I am so encouraged by your presence here tonight, and I need to make an important ask. Make your voices heard by attending school board meetings, enhance your education of school board candidates, and vote. Maybe you'll even consider becoming a school board candidate yourself, and the NEA can help you with that. In this moment, it is my hope that we can create school boards everywhere that are a reflection of our highest aspirations for every student so that we can say, all of us, that we are worthy of our children. Kyle? All right, thank you for your remarks, Becky. Um, as you mentioned, uh, these attacks are coming because public education is the foundation of an inclusive uh, democracy, economy, and society. And our partnership, Color of Change and uh, National Education Association, is one to ensure that that fight we are mounting is inclusive and matches our values. So Color of Change strives to also be a political home for Black people across the country. So now I'd like to welcome Rashad Robinson on the stage. Um, Rashad Robinson is president of Color of Change, a racial justice organization with more than 6 million members. Under Rashad's leadership, Color of Change led the $7 billion advertiser boycott of Facebook. We've changed how crime, policing, and race are represented on TV. We've won net neutrality as a civil rights issue and devised innovative strategies to hold decision makers accountable to black communities, from local prosecutors to multinational corporations. Rashad's analysis, advocacy, and activism is known nationwide, and he's frequently featured in national media. He's one of the co-chairs as well of the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information uh, Disorder. So Rashad, welcome. And uh, to kick off our discussion, uh, I wanna aim my first question at you. Uh, we saw the video, uh, but can you tell us from your vo viewpoint, what is at stake for not only just our nation, but obviously for our nation's children? 
Well, our future, first of all, um, thank you, Kyle. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us, taking your evening or their afternoon to come out and be in service, be in service of a better tomorrow, of fighting for a better tomorrow. Thank you, Becky and the NEA for standing 10 toes deep with us at Color of Change, but more importantly, for standing with the community as we not only wage these battles against the attack, but we work to build something new, as we work to continue to face down these struggles, but hopefully create a new aspirational future for all of us. And that, Kyle, in so many ways is what's at stake here. The attacks on Black history, the attacks on education are attacks on the future. They are attacks on what those who do not want to see a future where all of us can come together and all of us can succeed, they know that if they can take away our history, they can take away what's to come. And we know that when young people or when any of us learn about things like redlining, when we learn about systemic racism, when we learn that multiracial groups of people have constantly come together to fight for a better tomorrow and have done so both with black leadership, white leadership and leadership of all different colors coming together to fight, that the country has been made better. They want to erase that. They want to silence that because they know that the knowledge of that makes us stronger, makes us better. I got some of my earliest activism going into school board meetings as a young person in Riverhead, Long Island. Shout out to Riverhead, New York, because I saw someone in the chat um, from Riverhead, um, my um, hometown. And I just want to say um, that I got some of my earliest activism going into those school board meetings and fighting um, and standing up for more, more um, funding for the type of programs and, and classes that I wanted to see, fighting for the type of programs after school that I wanted to see. And the invitation to all of us is an invitation into fighting to make democracy work for all of us. The thing I wanna say, Kyle, is that the other thing that is at stake for all of us is that we can't mistake presence for power. Visibility and awareness of this issue are great, but power is our ability to actually change the rules. And so there are people on the other side that wanna change the rules one way, and it is gonna be us that have to come together to change the rules in the way that we wanna see it. And that's what we're here to do. That's what all of you are here to do, to be trained, to be engaged, to find partnership, and then to go into the places where decisions are made and to be part of making those decisions, to be the voices and the leaders that we've all been waiting for, the voices and the leaders that will move us forward. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Rashad. And, you know, um, now uh, to Becky, you know, our organizations, we've been working together for a while and we get to hear very frequently from you all as, you know, the, the biggest organization of teachers in the nation, um, what it is that educators are going through. So uh, can you share uh, for the folks here, what is it that you're hearing from educators? Uh, sure, Kyle. First of all, Rashad, so good to be in this space with you. Uh, always. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So I have the unique opportunity to travel all over this country and to hold space, not just for, for our teachers, but for our support staff, our bus drivers and counselors and nurses, our aspiring educators, those who are studying to become teachers, and our students. And uniformly, all of them are, 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 are absolutely struggling with this attack on for educators, their, their freedom to teach. And for our students, I, I, I met with a college student on many, one of my many trips to Florida um, at FAMU. Uh, and she, a sophomore, and she was saying to me, you know, it, through tears, I cannot believe that I chose, I dreamed all my life that I could go to a historically black college and university. And my faculty is under attack. They're being threatened with uh, funds being pulled from them if they teach about slavery in a way that is inconsistent with what they, uh, the governor, has declared slavery was about. That's at a black college and university. And I don't want you to think about K-12 and the kind of pressures that educators are under. Some who are being fired 
because they are teaching banned books or even books that haven't been banned yet. This questionable books because we have these vague laws that are being passed. So they are rightfully, it's rightfully having a chilling effect. It's one of the reasons why we as a union and in partnership with those who understand the importance of protecting educators' right to teach the truth are standing with them, making sure they know their rights, making sure that they know they're not alone. And that's why it's so important for parents and community, community members to be a part of school boards uh, at, or at the very least show up at school boards. So they are not uh, passing uh, uh, policies that ban books that we know are providing that opportunity for students to see themselves and to learn about others. And so as I listen to educators all over this country, they are they make me so proud every day that they're standing up in this moment. I, can I just say that? Um, and and for me to be able to share with them that they're not alone makes all the difference. Thank you so much for sharing that, Becky. And I know I've noticed from both of you, you're, you, you keep mentioning stand up and, and we have to unite and find our power in this moment. So, you know, Rashad, can you can you speak to what we mean by that? Like how and why um, should we be organizing? What does that really look like? What, what, what organizing looks like is it looks like us coming together and, and building a plan. It makes us, it looks like holding elected officials accountable so that they're nervous about disappointing our communities and they recognize that we're paying attention. It looks like um, when we need to, pulling together our own resolutions um, and our own um, sort of de list of demands um, on the school board. It's going to look like finding candidates sometimes to run. I oftentimes think about sometimes you have to go into the room and sometimes you have to kick in the door. And sometimes you have to, once you're in there, you've got to put someone in the seat um, if you want to make sure that the things are going to happen the way that you want them to happen. And um, power um, and the ability to change rules um, is... Um, is sort of our, our our responsibility here. It's our it's our calling. It's our it's our focus. And so when I think about sort of the work that each of us can do in our communities, it will be sort of about bringing folks together, getting really aligned about the things that we care about. And so yes, it's going to be about making the demands to protect Black history. But I just don't want us to be thinking about what we um, what we have to protect. I just don't want us to think about what we have to defend. This is also about advancing. This is about making sure that public education is fully funded. This makes this is about making sure that our teachers and our students and our and our community has all of the things that we um, we need. You know, far too often we talk about problems that are created and manufactured as the problems of the community that are actually dealing and suffering with it. We'll say things like black people are less likely to get a loan from the bank instead of saying banks are less likely to give loans to black people. And so we'll say things like, oh, we have to fix black people. We have to give them financial literacy. And actually, instead of saying, no, we have to fix the banks. And so we do have to fix institutions that stand in our way. And that means that we have to demand the type of investment this is not about fixing our parents or fixing our students, but about investing in our teachers, investing in our schools, and investing in our communities at the level that they actually deserve. And so, yes, today we are here to defend Black history, but I know that through our work to defend, we will also have to be on the offense because this is not just about what we want to protect, but what we want to unleash, what we hope to strive for, what we hope to build, what we hope to renew. This is not just about winning against the attacks, but winning for tomorrow. And that, I think, is the deep opportunity. That's why I think this partnership between Color of Change and NEA is so incredibly important, because we are not just fighting to, against our opponents, but we are fighting for our young people. It's very true. Thank you so much for saying that. You know, definitely a foot stomp there on, you know, I know we say this sometimes at, at Rashad, uh, Rashad at Color of Change. It's not just about defending Black history. It's about advancing the legacy. Right. right. So, um, Becky, if you would, um, our last question before, uh, you know, we, we move on into the, the training. Uh, what would you say is the most important thing that you think a parent, educator or student can do today to defend black history? Well, the first thing I would say is amen, Brother Rashad. 
That's all. I I I really should just stop there. I, I can't emphasize enough what he just said. And that's when we talk about promoting public education as a common good. We know my dad was a history teacher. We know that is the first thing to go. We know that those who, who want to destroy our democracy understand that if we don't have an educated citizenry, right? We will not have a democracy. That that's clear, and we and so we have to promote public education. We have to protect it. But but I talk all the time, Rashad, about strengthening. It can't be what it is now. It can't. We know we have under resourced our schools forever. We know that our teachers exist and have forever with this twenty six percent wage penalty gap, where we can't recruit enough teachers and we can't keep them. We know they have never been valued or respected for the professionals they are. We know we don't have a diverse teaching uh, force. We ha we have to promote. And so one of the things that we work um, with our partners on is, for example, at the school board level, advancing resolutions, not just defending against the stupid and the crazy. We have to advance what we want for our babies. So I can't can't I can't emphasize enough how important that is. Um, it is so critical that the folks who are, are gathered here tonight with us, you know, when Mashad answered the question, the, the first thing that you asked, Kyle, the first thing that came to my mind was vote, vote. We have to secure the environment for all that Rashad just laid out there. We have to secure the environment. We have to elect people who care about our kids. We have to hold them accountable. You know what, before I say that, we have to support them after we elect them. That means we're working with them to develop those resolutions that advance and close those inequities that are built into every single social system in this country. And then we have to hold them accountable to do just that. So it is so critical for folks on this on this call to, to take this training so they know how to, stand, to, to use their voice, so they know they can run and that they have people who are gonna support them through that. And so that they know they're not alone in standing for against what we know we we know cannot exist in 2023 in this democracy. And they are clear on what we need to promote so that our students mm -hmm. can be the leaders of a just society. All right. Thank you for those words, Becky. And I know, you know, our organizers at the event here today, um, you know, there's some there's some uh, there's some foundational aspects of organizing, which is, you know, providing people hope and providing them urgency and providing them a plan. So I know that we have that here today. Um, and for uh, you, Rashad, um, the group is about to go into the training um, where they're going to learn more about their role in fighting these book bans and advancing the legacy of black people in America. And I'd like to give you a moment for some closing remar remarks before we start the training. Uh, what would you like to say to the audience as they prepare for this? Well, this is a call to action moment, right? Five, 10, 15 years from now, we're all going to be thinking about what we did in this moment when these attacks happened, how we engaged, how we brought people together, how we stood up and fought back. And so the invitation is clear. Join us, work with us, help us build um, and do the work together so that we can win. And so I don't have a lot more to say because I want us to get into those trainings and I want us to do the work, but I hope that you will stay in contact with us at Color of Change. I hope you will tell your friends and your families about these trainings. So as we do more of them, that more people will continue to join us and we will continue to build the army, the chorus, the, the um, community of people necessary for us to be able to continue to push back and more importantly, to push forward um, all the things we need to achieve in order to win. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining. Um, we need you um, in this fight. None of this is possible without all of us coming together. So my deepest appreciation for you all taking your time, um, which is I know so critical during this, during this time of the year, but it's always critical any time of the year. And let's get out there, let's work together and let's win. Wow, what a powerful opening for our training today. Thank you, Rashad, Becky, Kyle, for showing up and setting the tone this evening. I'm so excited to get to lead you all through today's training. 
Here at Color of Change, I work alongside community members like yourself and partners across the country, building power, demanding change, and shifting the narrative together. <clears throat> I'm a proud product of public schools from Kansas City all the way to Los Angeles. 10 schools to be exact if you count my time at the Transition Center, the district's solution for discipline. I spent nearly half of my fifth grade year here. But in the sixth grade for the first time, there was something that was different. A team of educators behind me who looked like me, who believed in me, and soon literacy and history were my favorite subjects. Studying classics like Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry would forever shape me. And I would graduate from disruptive talks too much to a pleasure to have in class, but still talks too much. That's the power of great educators and curriculum that challenge you to see the world differently, walk in someone else's shoes and learn about your history. I still remember the first time I realized the power of a school board when I was 18. I opened up my laptop to the jarring headline, Kansas City School Board closes 28 schools. As I sat there, I remember questioning how they could make this decision. What gave them the power? And as I went down the rabbit hole to fail policy, I ultimately closed the tab and I went back to my studies. Looking back now, I can see how discipline policies, curriculum standards, budget decisions by school boards had the power to shape the education that I received. And today as a mother, I know how much is at stake every day when I send my girls off to school, hoping that they're affirmed for who they are in the world, that all children are taught an accurate history so that we can dismantle racism and that a quality education is attainable for all students, no matter the zip code. We're all here because we probably agree we can't afford to close this tab. We're up against an organized nationwide movement of extremist groups working hard to control what's taught in our classrooms what books can be read by students and what teachers can teach, all under the guise of fighting CRT, a college level law school theory, non-existent in our schools. But what does exist is them stopping children from learning about Ruby Bridges or reading from books or reading books from Nobel Prize winning authors like Toni Morrison. Banning books in conversation is systemic racism and it disempowers this next generation of students. Since January 2021, 44 states have introduced measures to restrict or limit how educators may discuss racism, sexism, and gender identity and other issues of systemic inequality in the classroom. Of those, 18 states have already enacted these restric restrictive education bills. But these are nothing more than those, the most recent attacks in the attempts at erasing Black history first from our classroom and then from our country. Communities across the country are showing up to school board meetings to demand that school curricula and libraries defend black history. And the recent election results across the country were loud and clear. Parents value quality education and teaching an accurate history over these mounting attacks. There are 95,000 school board members serving communities across the country. School boards are elected or appointed officials who represent a collective voice and interest in the local community, providing all students a quality education. School boards are one of the many local government bodies that support a community by implementing, developing, and reviewing policies that specifically impact student learning. They should be working with the community to set these vision. And we heard that a lot today about the power that we play and the role that we play in that. And they should be held accountable to families in the community and the district to ensure that this vision is implemented in an equitable, and measured way for success. When we think about our local school board councils, it's important to remember they should be operating and functioning to serve all students in the district. Most school board members are elected by voters in their community, but represent their to represent their values and their views. And some school board, <clears throat> some school board election, sorry, backing up. Um, a few select are appointed by mayors, city councils, board of supervisors, or other government officials. School board election engagement is estimated to be at around 10% nationally and as low as 2% in some districts. It's so important to be informed about your school board election. In some instances, school boards are taken over by different state departments, and often this results in officials making decisions that don't align with the community. What do the school boards do? What decisions do they make? And how do they affect me and my family? School boards are responsible for setting policy, 
developing and enacting policies and, res and resolutions that govern the district. Um, if you're concerned about textbook adoption and book bans, this is one place to look and see if it's being eliminate, eliminated and what you can do about it. School boards are responsible for approving those textbooks and curriculum materials. Some tasks may be done in consultation with the superintendent, but all should be done with the community input <clears throat> and involvement. School boards set policy, setting policy is important to ask, will these policies provide a, education, a quality education for all students? And do these policies represent our students? The second set is long range planning, the second responsibility, and that's establishing standards for student achieving achievement, working closely with the school and district on school schedules, supplies, safety, approving budgets, setting spending priorities, identifying and responding to public school needs and calculating enrollment and projections. These should be again done with special attention paid to any regulations imposed by the State Board of Education. And their last responsibility is evaluating results, evaluating the effectiveness and the impact of long range planning activities and policies. You can check out your local school board's annual reports to see how student success is being measured to help you evaluate policy effectiveness in your district. Showing up, show up <clears throat> to influence your school board. It's really never too late to join or get involved in decisions happening in your district. Com community members can attend open school board meetings, speak up, ask questions about policies during the public comment period, and introduce resolutions to create change on the local level. School boards typically meet once or twice a month on a set weekday. Meetings are open to the public and provide an opportunity for you to bring your voice, hear what's going on, and really get involved. Most school boards post their agendas on the website, so we're gonna get into a little bit later on how you can prepare to show up. I'm gonna pass it over to Sherelle, my partner here at NEA, and she's gonna guide you guys through our first reflection question today. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sherelle Eubanks. I'm a senior policy analyst at the National Education Association. And I have a question for you. Do you plan to attend a school board hearing or a school board meeting in your community based on everything that you just learned now? We just heard how important it is to attend um, school board meetings, to understand the responsibility of the school board, to know who your school board members are. So um, let us know. All right, thank you all for engaging in our survey for us today. We are going to get into how you can prepare to show up to your local school board. And showing up to your local school board, we can go to the next slide, please. And preparing for showing up to your local school board, we created a worksheet um, where the first step is really starting local and determining who's your district. And one of those areas that we really want fo folks to focus in on is identifying who is the school board president, who are the school board members, and when is the next election cycle? We created a cheat sheet here to kind of help you begin thinking about who's on your local school board and what issues are happening in your community. And so we'll be dropping that link in the chat for you so you can also begin, if you haven't already, um, going through those steps to identify your school board. Next slide or video, please.
All right. So we have a checklist here. If you have that cheat sheet, that also is going to help you. That video demo just showed you how simple it is to use this resource and identify who your local school board is, when they meet, um, and when the next election is. So I hope that resource can be a valuable um, tool for you to use in your um, journey to the school board. As as we get into our checklist and we think about showing up to our a local school board, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that come to mind when you're trying to figure out what's the public comment process at your district. Some of those questions that we have on the checklist for folks to really think through are when, what is your co public comment process? Where can you find the agenda? How long does it take? How long do you have to speak? If there's a virtual option, um, if there are any kind of speaking registration or requirements, these are all things that you can utilize and tools that you can utilize in preparing yourself to show up to the school board. And most importantly, thinking about what's at stake for students in your community. As you show up, listen to what's on the table. Write down the concerns and the questions that you have and ask yourself this question. What happens if I do nothing? You want to make sure that as you're informing yourself on the issues, like many of you guys here today, you're using reputable sources that you trust to prepare those talking points. When we think about those, that question of what happens if you do nothing, I like to frame this for you guys today. What happens if Black history is erased? What happens if our voices are silenced? And what happens if the education system fails our children? As we look at defending black history across the country, we're fighting back against the erasure of curriculum and poor, oh, sorry, the erasure of black and queer curriculum and poor quality of education. When we look at the erasure of black and queer history in K through 12 curricula, we're looking at the removal of authored books from library shelves. We're looking at the fact that truth, and these are just very, very matter of fact, truth that, is not being passed down. We know that education is power. We're looking at textbooks with inaccurate portrayals of history, attacks on educators who are resisting discrimination and education standards. When we look at the poor quality of education that our students are left to deal with, we have poor curriculum standards, limited course offerings, obstacles to college readiness, and underserved schools with a lack of resources and equity in education that is impacting our students, not to mention environmental harm, crumbling infrastructure, poor quality of food, and different things that actually are impacting our students at a higher level. As we get into the facts, they're pretty clear. This last year alone, <clears throat> we have over 33, over 30% of books that were banned were banning books around race and racism where they, where they featured um, characters of color. We have 26% where LGBTQ plus themes are featured LGB, LGBTQ plus characters were also banned. And this is just looking at over 800 titles that were banned at the first half of the year. The Florida Department of Education's 2023 social studies curriculum teaches that Black people personally benefited from slavery. And, to, and the International Baccarat and Cambridge Association signed an assurance agreement certifying that their courses would align with Florida's Don't Say Gay Law, which bans lessons on gender identity, sexuality, and forces students to be taught distorted versions of our history. And as we continue to look at what's happening around the country, we see and we know Arkansas and Florida have banned students from AP African American Studies during the 2023-2024 school year. We have um, 25 states that have banned social emotional learning, which helps students develop their interpersonal skills. And we have librarians receiving death threats um, for trying to teach children to love books. Um, one in four of librarians have reported to being harassed about books being displayed in their library. Absent accurate black history lessons mean black students will be denied meaningful representation and the tools needed to examine and dismantle the systems of oppression and power that hold us back. Black students are yet 33, 35% 
of children bullied for their race. Of 20,000 LGBTQ plus youth surveyed, 80% reported feeling unsafe in their schools. And nearly half of the secondary social studies teachers said that students engage in demeaning behavior of LGBTQ plus students. Absent access to college level courses and credit, black students are gonna face greater barriers to, to academic and post-secondary success. White students already are 250% more likely to graduate than black students in public universities. 20, a 2017 study found that ninth grader students enrolled in ethnic studies courses substantially increased their high school graduation rate. So we know that when you see yourself reflected in the, the world around you, it is going to increase the graduation rates for our students. So we know culturally responsive and racially inclusive education is gonna impart students with a sense of self, of the world that leads them to be more informed, critical and socially responsible citizens. And that's what the we all need that in the world. In, in numerous studies, as we continue to look at how, why we must act, we know that all students are robbed of this effective education and the unique experiences of Black communities when they're not taught. It's not allowing children to see themselves in it. A number of studies and researchers have evaluated the impact of African-American curricula on African-American students, and they're all a resounding. They all found a positive correlation in the three areas of supporting students um, educational success. If you look here at the facts on this slide, you'll see that in 2012, researchers evaluated the impact of Afrocentric U.S. history curriculum on self-efficiency, connection to the curriculum, and academic achievement. And of those 217 eighth graders, 97 percent who were African-American or Hispanic using New York State Social Studies tested higher. So it's it's a fact that when we are taught a curriculum that centers a true history that tells the struggle and the triumph, it will inspire our children to see themselves and continue to progress in this world. So as we are looking at these facts and thinking about what's at stake for our students in our community, we hope that these talking points will that these facts will help you guide you as you are crafting out your talking points and thinking about the issues that are at stake in your community. I'm gonna pass it back to Sherelle so we can get into our second survey question today. Thank you, Destiny. Um, I have another question to ask you. Do you believe um, your student's education has negatively been impacted by book ban, course restrictions, poor quality of education, specifically when it comes to history of social studies or and or all of the above. I'll take a moment to respond to the question and, and let us know. And also if um, there's something that I didn't mention that you um, believe has harmed um, your students, then you can let us know that as well. Thanks, Sherelle. Thanks, Thank Destiny. Thanks, everyone, for engaging in the chat. We're going to get into our last portion of the training today. Um, we talked about, we heard our presidents both talk about bringing resolutions forward. So we wanted to make sure that we talk a little bit more about what school board resolutions are. So resolutions are measures adopted by school boards that often lead to official school board policies. Policy change by bringing um, a official policy change by bringing community member concerns forward and proposing these changes through resolutions. Resolutions should describe the history and the facts behind the issues for the proposed resolution and, the, and provide the district with the proposed course of action, putting the power in your hands as parents and community members, students to show up and actually put a resolution forward. To adopt a new policy or resolution, most school boards must host a series of public meetings to introduce these measures, take a formal vote on the resolution or the policy, 
and it must receive a formal majority of votes to be adopted. Community members and stakeholders have the right to attend these public meetings where the board adopts and brings in new policy or resolutions. Community members and stakeholders also have the right to public comment before the vote. Again, be sure to fill out that cheat sheet and check out the rules and regulations in your district as you're preparing to show up for public comment and think about introducing resolutions. All right, so as we talk a little bit about resolutions, I wanted to sh break down a resolution and action um, from 2021 um, that our members on the ground in Oakland. Um, so in 2021, the Black Organizing Project in Oakland, California, worked with students, parents, and community members to draft 12 resolutions for the Reparations for Black Students campaign. By organizing 11 of these 12 resolutions were passed by the state, but at the last minute, the State Board of Education flexed the veto power on a resolution that prevented the school closures. This campaign was still a powerful example of resolutions in action and the power of parents and community organizing. When we talk about the part one of a resolution and describing the history, the values, and the facts behind the issues for the proposed resolution, the Reparations for Black Students campaign really was looking specifically at the decline in Black students in the district and how this correlated with the district school closures. The premise for the Oakland Reparations for Black Students campaign rested on evaluating and seeing in black and white the harm OUSD had specifically placed on black students and families for decades in the district and aimed to set policy within the local school board that could evaluate this on the long term. So if, if you look at the example here, you'll see that one of the first um, part one of the resolution, they talk about the responsibility to promote a healthy environment and then we get into the second portion and they talk about eliminating the opportunity gaps between student demographic groups. So they were able to utilize these reports to put together very strong resolutions around the changes that they were demanding in their local community. And so this is one um, resolution in action that I wanted to highlight and really um, highlight the organizing that happened to make this possible. And then as we move into resolutions, um, I want to share with you all a resolution template or a resolution resource. Um, our, we have partners on the call tonight, United Against Book Bans, and they actually have a resolution resource and toolkit for stopping book bans in your local school district that's downloadable and it can be edited to support your fight to keep Black history on bookshelves. So along with the training materials, um, tonight, you'll also be getting all these amazing resources um, to help you in your fight. I'm going to pass it over to Sherelle because we're going to get into a little bit more around resolutions and some resources from NEA. Thank you, Destiny. Um, in response to um, the efforts of some politicians to stoke um, social and racial division, to put some students into boxes, um, to ban books from the shelves, and to censor our history. NEA's developed um, the Freedom to Learn model school board resolution template, as well as a toolkit that can help um, be used to protect our students' freedom to learn. Um, so in addition to all the checklist and the um, model resolution on book banning. NEA also offers and has um, developed a whole suite of tools um, to help um, parents and educators and communities um, pass resolutions, offer um, policy solutions to help to, um, to eliminate some of the things, some of those things that you were concerned about that I asked you about in the chat. You see there, there's um, a pledge if you text Freedom to 48744, you can pledge to um, defend students' freedom to learn, to defend um, Black history. Um, and if you, um, if you uh, also text that, then you can receive information and resources related to this from the NEA. Um, the next slide, please. 
in our um, Freedom to Learn Toolkit, it provides um, people with a step-by-step -step guide on how to get um, our model resolution um, passed or any um, school board resolution passed. And I'm just going to highlight some of the steps that would need to be, that you would need to take um, to try to get a school board resolution passed in your district. Um, one of the first things that I would like to point out is you cannot do this alone. Um, you will definitely need the support of other parents, community members, students, if they are old enough to engage, and educators, and preferably members of the school board. So it will be um, up to a, a member of the school board to introduce um, the resolution, and you will need the support of, of the majority of the school board to pass the resolution. Um, on the slide, um, you see you know, some strategies that you can use to start to collect your team um, that would be working with you to um, advance your school board. So you can survey um, you know, members of the school board to see where they are. You can um, work with uh, the PTAs, with your uh, faith community and others to make sure that you have adequate support um, for your uh, school board resolution. Next slide, please. Um, if you have the support of one or more of the members of your school board, you'll want to engage them in the process. Um, and ideally, you would be working with them to um, for them and having them take the lead to um, get you know to pass the the resolution. Um, however, you might find that you don't have the support um, from or strong support for passing the resolution in the beginning and you will need to develop a strategy um, to begin to garner that support. And um, part of your strategy should include relationships with school board members and other community leaders. It will also include educating the public. Um, a lot of you know, our community members um, might not know or understand um, what's at stake, um, um, destiny, um, talked a lot about what happens if we don't do anything. And um, we really need to make sure that we're having conversations with everyone in the community, um, that they realize that um, if we don't um, protect our children, um, there's so many aspects of our community that are in jeopardy. And then um, you may need to apply pressure um, in addition to, you know, having good and strong relationships, um, you might not automatically or easily um, get your uh, school board members or other elected leaders on board, and you may need to um, apply pressure there. Next slide, please. One of the things that you will also need to do is to um, engage the media to get um, visibility for your resolution. Um, and this could include local media. Um, it could include, you know, um, writing up ads, um, doing interviews on the radio, um, you know, speaking, you know, at, with parent groups, but you will definitely need to have do some outreach and get visibility for your resolution. Um, if you are not successful in your first attempt to get your resolution passed, um, your team will need to um, determine the next steps and where and how you might be able to apply pressure. And um, please know that you may not get a school board resolution passed um, in a first attempt, maybe not even in a whole school year. You may need to continue. You, this may be a year or more. However, you know, these issues are important. They never stop being important. So don't be discouraged. Um, and also, no, school boards turn over. And if you have an elected school board, um, with members who are looking to be reelected, there may be opportunities there to la leverage the next election cycle um, to garner support um, and to let people know that you will be 
looking to elect or reelect pro public um, education uh, school board candidates who believe in defending black history, who believe in making sure that schools have the books and the resources and the educators that they need to make sure that your students are able um, to, you know, to move forward, um, you know, to the next phase of their life um, and be successful. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to um, Destiny um, to, to close us out, but I think I, I I do want to close by just letting you know that showing up starts with using your voice because there's so much power in our stories. And I'm um, going to, I think it, oh, there's Karina. I thought it was, I thought I was passing it to Destiny. So I'm going to pass it to Karina so she can share with you her story and hopefully inspire you um, for, to get involved in your local school board. Thank you, Sherelle. Welcome, everyone. We are closing out. Um, appreciate Destiny and Sherelle for helping us understand how we can take action at our next school board meeting. Um, for myself, as an organizer and a coach, it's important for me to center personal stories to create a clear picture of one's unique life. Stories help us amplify our work, the work that I do here at Color of Change for racial and social justice. Stories like the one you heard today help us connect the heart, the mind, and the hands, and most importantly, with others. Sharing my story really frees me, um, and I hope it does the same for others like you all here today. I often think about my 15-year-old self with my head down and my watermelon belly, wobbling to my fifth period class, wondering how I would finish school while caring for a baby. I was at my halfway mark and I looked forward to being the last look forward to being the last week of school before I continued my education at home. Um, at the time, I was unaware that Bilal High School had a child care for students, mothers like myself. Mrs. Loretta, a teacher at the baby lab, approached me and asked if I could visit the center. With one sniff, the lavender scent in room calmed me, and I love lavender, y'all, to this day. Seeing a young mother breastfeeding their baby with lullabies playing in the background really felt like a safe haven. Mrs. Loretta explained they were under attack due to lack of funding. She asked me if I would join her at the school board meeting to help support and urge the, urge the board not to close down um, the school board, uh, sorry, to not close down the baby lab. I still wanted to walk the stage and I wanted to celebrate with my friends, but immediately I said no without thinking because eyes already wondered and voices already gossiped. I couldn't imagine speaking up and telling others why someone like me deserved a second chance. I mean, funding can go towards students who made better decisions than I did. After a week of strategizing other solutions, I knew that I had to be courageous and I had to advocate for myself and others like me because despite our choices, we were still kids who are worthy of love and support. Today, I am a mom of a son who is half my age and it wasn't until this school board, uh, the first school board training, how many people came to the first school board training that we had in the summer? So Destiny here encouraged me to share this story because I have yet to share this story. So shout out to Destiny, the marvelous storyteller who encouraged me to share my story. Um, being a 15 year old pregnant girl who needed support to graduate on time so I wouldn't be left behind like the many teen moms before me. And my solution was attending a school board meeting with complete strangers to encourage them to be my hero in my story. 15 years later, the baby lab is still standing and I am no longer surviving, I am thriving. Color of Change has been the vehicle that has gently nudged me and many others to reclaim our voice and power to fight the injustices in the world, including our right to live the so-called American dream. I wanna invite everyone on this call to think about a time in your life when despite being uncomfortable, you leaned into your power and you shared your story, or a time when you had a positive experience with a school official like the one I had with Mrs. Loretta. I know a lot of times we think about the struggles that we had. A lot of times we think about those negative experiences, but I want you guys to think a little deeper. And was it a time when you were in kindergarten or in fifth grade where someone encouraged you to be yourself and to talk about the things that maybe you didn't want to talk about? Um, so I want to ask folks, there's going to be one more last poll here. 
And I want to ask, would you like to join our Defending Black History Storytelling um, workshop on December 13th or 2023? If you're interested in sharing your experiences to create real change for students in your community with your kids, your nephews, your nieces, please fill out the poll and let me know if you are down to attend. This store uh, workshop is for parents, for students, for educators, for anyone that wants to learn how they can share their story and also so think through other ways to create with like-minded people to show up for your school board. And also, I also want to say that these are some other ways where you guys can continue showing up for us. Um, yeah, organize the fight. So these are other ways you can use your voice, continue coming to our training on the 13th. Um, the links are being dropped in the chat. You can also sign our petitions. You can create your own campaign. But most importantly, every day when you show up, ask your kids, ask other kids, what are you learning today? What are you doing today? What was the joyful moment that you had at school? Like I said, I think with Miss Loretta, I couldn't think about the joyful moments. I kind of had to think about, like, how was I going to survive instead of thrive? Um, so, yeah, I want to encourage you all to sign up for our workshop. Destiny and I will be leading that. We have our next steps here, um, which is take the pledge. If you all can text freedom to 48744 to take action right now. The links are dropping. If you can show up to our school board meetings and also after this call, we will be doing some follow-up calls to get to know you a bit more. I know there's a lot of people on the call. Thank you all for joining and we wanna ensure that you get a personal call from us so we can think through how we can all support each other. Everyone have a good night.